Welcome to today's edition of Our Homes, Ending the Housing Crisis. Uh, my name is Ryan Catalani and I'll be your host today. Our guest is Philip Garboden, the HCRC Professor in Affordable Housing Economics, Policy and Planning at the University of Hawaii at Manoa in the Department of Urban and Regional Planning, also with the University of Hawaii Economic Research Organization. Uh, we have a lot of interesting topics to cover in this next hour, including plenty of ideas about solutions, uh, but we'll also take a hard look at the current landscape, including how the, uh, the pandemic's effect on housing and how housing intersects with race. Um, but first, we wanted to get to know you, the audience, a bit better. Um, so just wanted to put up this brief poll to see who is, has joined us today. Um, let me see if this will work. So if you could just answer those some brief questions to see who is here today. Um, so just wanted to put up. This poll is anonymous also, so, you know, it's okay if you uh, have not been involved with housing issues, that, that would be great to know, actually. Just give everyone a few more seconds to vote and um, all right, well, thanks everyone for voting. We will, it looks like a lot of you um, are pretty closely involved with housing, um, either uh, in your job or as an advocate, or at least you have been following um, housing issues um, at some level. So that's good to know. And, um, and thanks for letting us know, since I think this will help to, to drive this discussion and future discussions also. So Phil, you can assume that people have uh, heard of housing and, and maybe some basic concepts. Terrific, terrific. Um, so let's, let's start with some background about you though. Um, you're an uh, assistant professor with a PhD specializing in um, affordable housing issues, but your bachelor's degree is in classical and Greek, and Greek <laughs> English literature. So you must have had an interesting journey to, to where you are now. Can you tell us a bit about that? Sure. Yeah. Um, I would. I wouldn't. I wouldn't discourage uh, anyone from pursuing a, a classical Greek degree in undergrad. Um, maybe a little less relevant here. Um, uh, on the other hand, if you want uh, a job or anything like that, um, you might want to. Might do something more practical. But I, I had a lovely time studying classical Greek in undergrad. Um, pretty much by the un end of my um, end of my time, and this was this was back in two thousand or so. Um, you know, I sort of drifted away from from classics and more into social justice work. Um, spent a pretty significant gap. You know, a lot of a lot of folks and a lot of professors go straight from undergrad to grad school and then on to professorship. And um, while that's a perfectly reasonable path, I felt like having um, you know almost a decade of real world experience working in uh, economic development nonprofits in Philadelphia, primarily uh, some in Washington D.C. Um, helped sort of inform what. I wanted to do uh, when I went back to graduate school and um, housing just seemed, you know, one of the most impressing issues of our time, you know, a, a way in which um, if you care about advocating for the well-being of poor families, housing was, at least to me, the, one of the lowest hanging fruits there. I mean, there's plenty of, plenty of work to be done um, on a variety of fronts, but um, housing, because it is so essential to the lives of families, um, always seemed to take priority in my, in my interest. So, um, and I had great mentors throughout my graduate uh, experience, um, both in, in economics and sociology, so. Well, it's good to know that you sort of balance this perspective, this research perspective with the real world practical um, applications that you saw in your, in your work on the ground. Um, and of course, housing is uh, a foundational, no pun intended, um, <laughs> issue for all of us. Um, so what, what um, particular interests with respect to, to housing and affordable housing have you, have you focused on? 
Yeah, most of my sort of national work, and I'm sort of, I sort of think of myself operating in two buckets. You know, I'm, I have a really specific Juliana here to serve the affordable housing community uh, by, you know, conducting analyses, providing data, uh, providing information. Nationally, um, you know, housing is so broad that, you know, most folks tend to spe specialize in one type of housing policy. And so most of my work there has been around housing choice vouchers. Um, you know, Section 8 vouchers is still what everybody calls them, but they're, they've they been officially renamed to housing choice vouchers for um, branding reasons. Um, and um, within that, specifically looking at this very tough question that I know Hawaii um, continues to deal with is how do you incentivize landlords to accept housing vouchers, um, specifically in neighborhoods, apartment units, things like that, where, um, you know, they have profitable alternatives for, for market rate tenants, right? So how do you how do you both reform the voucher program to make it something that landlords are more enthusiastic about, but then also how do you sort of market and promote um, housing vouchers as a as a key part of um, something that um, something that landlords should should be doing um, specifically around maintaining their bottom lines, right? So when you're a, a landlord, specifically a landlord of lower income folks, you're sort of at the mercy of the vicissitudes of the low end labor market, right? Low end temporary jobs come in and out fairly frequently. Um, and so if you're not taking vouchers, your income stream is gonna depend on that. Where, as if you do accept vouchers, um, your tenants income drops, um, perhaps because of a global pandemic, perhaps just because that's what happens in the low end market, um, you're protected from that. Um, of course, the downside is that you have a lot more sort of government surveillance of what you're doing as a rental property owner. You have to go inspections, contractual relationships with HUD and others. So um, there are pros and cons, but um, you know, I tend to push on the pros, especially in moments of economic insecurity like we're facing right now. So. Yeah, well, let's, let's um, dive into the housing choice vouchers um, a little bit later on, but maybe we can um, start by getting some context of how you see and how your research has, has shown the affordable housing crisis to be. Uh, and just a quick note to people watching, if you do have questions along the way, you can either use the chat feature or the Q&A feature to let us know um, as you think of these questions, and, and we'll try to get to all of them. Um, so in terms of the current landscape of housing, um, you know, one thing I think that's interesting to start with for, for you specifically, you researched housing issues in Baltimore um, and identified what you called the double crisis of poverty and housing affordability. Can you, can you tell us a bit more about that? Absolutely. And, you know, that was, uh, that was commissioned by a, a nonprofit uh, foundation in, uh, in Baltimore. But I think the lesson from there applies to every city in the country and, and in probably the world. Um, and it starts with this fact that we have this sort of problematic singular measure of housing affordability, which is the housing cost burden, right? And so um, for reasons that are more political than empirical, HUD decides that the right amount of money you should spend on your housing is 30% of your income. Um, you know, there is evidence that that's a pretty good amount in terms of, you know, sort of the well-being and the well-being of children. but um, you know, that number is, was picked not, not particularly rigorously. Um, and then over 50% is sort of your high burden. And the issue with that number um, is that in my mind, it really conflates two separate but important problems. Um, the first problem is what I think in that report, um, I call the income problem or the income crisis, right? And that's that within any city, there's going to be a, a group of folks um, whose incomes really can't support market rate housing um, of any quality, right? I mean, we have, of any quality, I should say, below, you know, what we as a, as a nation assume is minimum quality um, allowable housing. So, um, you know, folks who are unemployed, uh, folks who have barriers to employment, um, such as disability, such as age, other things like that, um, their income or 30% of their income is simply not adequate to, um, even maintain a housing unit at a reasonable standard, right? Um, and so for those folks, you really need to think about interventions that aren't market interventions, right? They're not about how the housing market in a particular area is functioning. It's about supporting the needs of those people through subsidies, through, you know, those subsidies can be demand side subsidies in terms of vouchers. They can be supply side subsidies in terms of things like the housing tax credit, you know, this 
600 volumes of debate about which is better and for whom and why, but at the end of the day, for that population, subsidies are really necessary. The other group, right, um, is the folks, and you know, here in Hawaii, we have an enormous number, I think, of, of both these groups. The other group is for folks whose incomes under normal market conditions should be able to support a profitable, you know, re a rent, uh, rental apartment or a homeownership scenario for them. Um, but because of a variety of market failures, aren't able to do that, right? Um, and we look at historical trends, that the income group has always been there, right? And it's been something that has been highly underserved, primarily through federal programs um, for the last 40 years, right? What we're seeing, um, and I think the positive thing in some ways um, about the conflation of these two issues is what we're seeing is a big increase in the second issue, right? We're seeing families who 20 years ago, 30 years ago, whose incomes, you know, socioeconomic status should support housing without a subsidy, um, now being unable to find that subsidy. Um, in markets, I mean, Honolulu is an extreme example of this, but you know, that's relevant even in a city like Baltimore that has 16,000 abandoned houses. So, um, you know, and my response there is that you have to think about these separately because you have different policy responses, right? You can't deal with the income crisis by reversing market failure, and you can't deal with the um, cost crisis by, you know, or it's very inefficient to deal with the cost crisis by providing subsidies um, to the families, right? And so really thinking about those things separately, obviously it's a big tent coalition that you need to bring to bear on these issues, but always being sure that any particular policy, and we see this in all the policies that are coming through um, here in Honolulu and in Hawaii generally, you know, some are meant to address the income crisis, some are meant to address the rent crisis, you know, both are necessary. And it's just, to me, it's important to understand which is doing which and, um, and make sure that both need to be served. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, I, your, your research was on the East Coast, but I was going to say it is eerily similar to our situation here. I'm sure people watching will, what you said will resonate exactly. Um, we've seen the disparities, for example, in the Alice Report, the Aloha United Way Alice Report, that, you know, showed that we have some people living under the poverty level, but we have a lot more people um, who are just making, barely making ends meet. So is that, is that sort of the distinction you're talking about here locally? Exactly, exactly. Um, and the folks under the poverty level, they've never been able to afford their housing, except for the ones who are fortunate to get a subsidy. You know, subsidies serve about one in five, one in four of the eligible people in that category, which is a huge social problem, in my opinion. Um, and then, but if you look historically in terms of burdens, it's that middle group, the Alice families, that we're really seeing the skyrocketing um, of housing burdens, of sacrifices those families need to make in order to just have a house of, of any quality, of any legal quality. So that certainly suggests that, you know, later on um, this hour when we talk about solutions, we should be looking at, you know, maybe not the same exact things for both groups. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, well, let's talk about some current events going on as, you know, <laughs> nationally, globally, um, the, these forces are shaping affordable housing in Hawaii, too. Um, starting, let's say, with COVID-19, which is having or perhaps poised to have um, huge effects on our affordable housing crisis. Um, you've seen and you've published about how people who are already the most vulnerable pre-pandemic are also the hardest hit now. Um, is, is that a fair characterization? Completely, yeah. Um, you know, the COVID response, which from a, you know, epidemiological perspective, avoiding sort of the much worse outcome of a enormous pandemic. Um, the downside of that is that it has been largely inequality um, exacerbated, right? So existing inequalities in society are made worse when you have a, a recession, no matter what the source of that recession is, but particularly a recession like the one we're having. Um, and, um, and other aspects of sort of shelter in place, things like that. So, you know, for all the necessity of what has occurred here um, and everywhere in the country, well, not everywhere, I guess, but um, in most sensible places in the country, um, you know, nonetheless, we have to be very focused on what we've done around inequality. And um, we're seeing that locally, we're seeing that nationally. 
And if anything, we don't want to, we want to try to mitigate how it's going to ex further exacerbate um, the existing crisis. Um, you've been on the House Select Subcommittee that's been focused on housing issues, uh, and just, which just released some recommendations about, in particular, I think, how to help out renters. Yeah. Um, it was just posted, I want to say, yesterday or the day before. So can you tell us a little bit about what those recommendations are for those who haven't seen? Absolutely. So. Um, for that work, you know, we're dealing with the reality of, um, you know, the number is different depending on, you know, what's already been allocated to what, but, you know, sort of a big pool of about seven, $650 million um, that can be used for COVID related response in general. Right? Um, so that's everything from healthcare to, you know, temperature thermometers to housing to unemployment to you know, food to, you know, um, and so, you know, there's been a lot of really hard choices and those hard choices I don't think are over. Um, I think the, the political process is now about to kick in to make, you know, the additional even harder choices there. But we as a committee focused on, you know, what are we seeing in terms of renters um, specifically um, and their vulnerabilities. And that's not at all to um, minimize the impact of COVID on homeowners, specifically low income homeowners. Um, and I believe the report does, you know, sort of talk about how to support folks there. You know, our focus on renters was based on two logics. One is that they're just significantly more vulnerable, right? The median household income for renters is 57K. The median household income for homeowners is 100K. Um, and the federal government, for all what I think is a very inadequate response, um, has done a better job in some ways of protecting homeowners, um, specifically those with federally backed loans. Um, that unfortunately excludes folks with jumbo loans. Um, unfortunately, given our housing crisis, we have a disproportionate number of jumbo loans, even amongst, you know, you normally think, oh, a jumbo loan, that must be only rich people, right? But, you know, a jumbo loan, the threshold for a jumbo loan is about the median housing price here, right? And so large families, all sorts of things are going to fall through that crack. So um, I want to, I want to make a pitch for the need to support uh, homeownership as well. But our our report really looked at renters um, and our estimates, and there should be, if folks who really want to dig into the numbers here, um, New Hero, any minute now, I think, uh, should be releasing a, uh, just sort of a summary of how we did some of these calculations. We're providing code if anyone wants to go and dig into GitHub and, and make different assumptions and see what numbers they get. Um, we always welcome that. So, um, but, our, but based on our assumptions of where the job losses are going to fall and where they're going to persist through the end of the year, because of course the CARES money needs to be spent by January 1, um, the, we were estimating about 45,000 renter households are going to experience at least one job loss, right? So we have a lot of multiple uh, earner households here in Hawaii, and so, you know, maybe uh, the husband loses his job, but the wife doesn't, or the wife loses a job and the husband doesn't. Um, but nonetheless, we're going to see some form of COVID-induced income decline uh, for about 45,000 households. Up until um, August 1st, a lot of those households, not all of them, but a lot of those households um, are basically being made even once they get their unemployment by the federal augmentation to existing unemployment. Right. So normally you get about 60% of your income for unemployment. Um, the federal additional $600 a week means that for families earning less than 60K, they're basically temporarily made okay, right? So we're not seeing yet enormous waves of housing, of manifested housing insecurity, right? Um, the eviction moratorium notwithstanding, we're just, you know, the unemployment insurance system is doing what it's supposed to be doing. That's not, of course, again, to ignore folks who aren't getting unemployment, who aren't eligible, who are struggling to get approved and all of those types of things. Um, the issue is that on August 1st, that as far as we can tell from the federal government, that step up is gonna go away. Um, and when it does, we're gonna see significantly increased housing cost burdens for, we're estimating about 22,000 households, uh, renter households, not even. And about 7,000 of those are um, gonna see a huge increase. Right, so we're, the metric we're using for that is that their housing burden is going to increase by 30 percentage points. Right, so if you were 30 percent burdened uh, before COVID, now you're 60 percent. You know, in some places that number goes up to 100 percent of your income. Um, and so it's really important, um, assuming there's no federal 
intervention there to think of a program that can help keep those folks in their homes um, and in their homes, you know, ideally for the long term, at least until January 1st. And um, the committee's program, which I, you know, be doing a little bit of violence too by trying to summarize it quickly. I, you know, the report is, I think, really well written. James Kashiba managed the whole committee process um, really wonderfully. Um, you know, what we're recommending is um, a rent support system um, of basically the idea is of your rent, um, the household would be responsible for 60% of that. The state, sort of the administering agency, would be responsible for 25% of that. And then we're hoping that landlords, rather than losing a month of rent through eviction, might be willing to take a 15% reduction um, in those you know, the last six months of the year's payments um, in order to keep that in their homes, right? Um, and you know, this was all done in consultation with landlords and landlord groups who thought that that, while no one's enthusiastic about taking a 15% cut, that that seemed like a reasonable figure that given the alternative of having no tenant and not necessarily being able to replace that tenant quickly, um, seemed like a good distribution of the burden between the household, the state, and, and the property. Um, so I think it's a pretty elegant uh, proposal. Um, you know, we have lots of details about implementation, targeting, all of those types of things in the proposal that I don't want to get into. But, um, you know, it, it seems like um, a way of really helping um, renter households stay in their homes until the end of the year. After that, you know, we're going to have another big cliff when uh, January 1st comes along and the CARES money has to be spent or gone. We're going to have another cliff when UI right now is only, you're only supposed to get it for 36 weeks. Um, 36 weeks is coming up fast for people who are unemployed in March. And so we need to think about that, whether we expand unemployment, whether we, um, again, hopefully the federal government's going to be a partner in this um, efforts because the state's just have resource restrictions that the federal government doesn't have. So, um, so that's the proposal. Um, you know, I encourage everyone, all faith action membership, to read it. Um, you know, this is a this is a proposal, and we love we love comments and and thoughts and all of that. So. Well, thanks for doing your best to to summarize that so quickly. I and hope yeah. I didn't make <laughs> you forgot this. Part. <laughs> um, and we will encourage everyone to go read the full thing um, as well. Um, Another big topic um, in in housing, uh, or I should say nationally, um, is of course race, race relations, racism, anti-racism, I should say. Uh, and housing is inextricable from those forces also. Uh, I think I'd be remiss in this moment not to ask how in your work you've seen um, that factor into housing. Yeah. Um, that's a really important question. Um, you know, I have some direct experience with that having been in Baltimore um, during the Freddie Gray uh, killing and then the subsequent uh, uprising um, in the city around that. And to me, you know, I don't pretend to be any kind of an expert on policing. Um, there's certainly people at UH who are much more sophisticated thinkers about race and race relations than I am. Um, but I do think about housing, and I think one of the core things that comes through um, to me is the way that these systems uh, of policing are made possible is through a legacy of an incredibly exclusionary, discriminatory, or predatory, right? All those things are operating simultaneously, housing systems, specifically for African Americans um, throughout, you know, on the U.S. mainland who, um, for any number of reasons, there's a really good book um, uh, Kianga Yamada Taylor wrote recently called Race for Profit, uh, which provides one such example. I could provide half a dozen books that talk about other examples of the way that um, government policy, real estate practices concentrated um, African American populations in particular areas, which of course then facilitates policing practices that are not um, benign. Right, that are um, that are seen as not um, part of the community in a way that we would hope that police would be seen as, you know, a, a force within the community. Right, um, a colleague of mine, Monica Bell, writes about what's called legal estrangement, which is the sense that um, low-income African American communities, and I would imagine African American is her focus, but this could apply to um, any disadvantaged minority community. Um, 
including those here in Hawaii, um, have come to the point where they see police forces not there as someone to protect against, you know, crime, but as someone who's there to sort of manage daily life in a way that um, they have no faith is designed to protect them, right? And that, and that breakdown is incredibly consequential and I think leads um, to contexts in which the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and many other folks um, over the last week um, are, is allowed to, um, is much more likely to occur, right? Um, I'll put it that way. So, um, and so I think this is something we always want to be thinking about when we're designing our current housing systems, right? Housing policies are not race neutral. They're not um, neutral insofar as different groups will benefit from different ways. Where affordable housing is built, the barriers, I mean, I know you had the folks from California Yimby on a few weeks ago, the barriers to accessing certain neighborhoods experienced by people of color um, in indigenous communities are, um, you know, something we always want to be thinking hard about when we design our, our policy, public policy and public programs. It's, it's, you know, I'm always a, you know, a harm reduction first kind of a person, you know, getting people subsidies, getting people housing, but we want to make sure that in the process of doing that, we're not creating systems, um, it, you know, of, of racial stigmatization, of racial oppression. So um, I'm happy, you know, and I have, that it was, yeah, again, to do, to do a topic justice would have involved much more, um, and I'm happy to share any number of good books that sort of provide the context for um, around housing um, and, um, and Black Lives Matter that uh, folks would be interested in. Sure, well, maybe uh, we can share those with the attendees afterwards um, in a follow-up email or something. Uh, but thank you for that and for the reminder that we really do need to be centering race in any discussions about affordable housing because whether we like it or not, uh, intentionally or not, there will be, well, um, left unchecked disparate impacts um, from, from what we see. Um, now in Hawaii, um, you know, just briefly, um, we talked yesterday about how there are, are maybe some limitations to, to how we can study those effects, though, as we're developing these policies. Yeah, so, um, so you know, I've only been here two years, um, and so I don't want to necessarily, you know, be too confident about my, my understanding. But, uh, but I think that uh, it is wrong to assume that race doesn't matter here. I think race, and specifically indigeneity, um, in terms of how Native Hawaiians are treated, in terms of the way Micronesians are treated, are um, incredibly important and incredibly important for housing policy as well. Um, the issue, I think, and this is a, a, as a data-driven researcher, uh, um, I am infinitely frustrated with, is how current systems for how data is collected, um, both by, certainly by the federal government, but even, you know, local, um, local administrative data, generally race is not collected in categories that uh, reflect the way the race works here in Hawaii, right? I mean, you know, the sort of, you know, the most egregious example is sort of the Asian Pacific Islander category, right? That in Baltimore, you know, may be collecting a, a small group of folks. Here, that category obscures more than it reveals, right? And so, um, you know, and this is something we're seeing all over the place. Um, we're trying to do unemployment data analysis, right? And there we have a choice between federal data or we have local data. And neither one, I think, is really getting at the racial potential racial disparities, right? Um, and so I think when you can't measure something, it becomes somewhat easy to ignore, right? Um, and so one of my many soapboxes is always pushing towards, you know, can we get good data? Can we get good data that's developed by people who, unlike, you know, I'm not included in this list, who are experts in racial situation here um, so that we can see what the reality is here, right? Um, in some ways it's easier when you have a city like Baltimore where the over 90% of the population is either black or white. Um, it's a clear uh, division that is collected quite well in federal data um, and it's easy to do that analysis. Here it becomes a lot more complicated, but that's just means we need to work a little harder to get at these important issues. So. Well, I think that is a great call to action that we should, um, you know, um, even if we're just affordable housing advocates, we should be considering strongly moving forward too. Um, on the more local front, um, 
in terms of current issues, you know, there's this um, affordable housing project in uh, Kailua that um, is undergoing some community engagement processes now, um, the Kwai Nui Apartments. Uh, it, it, it appears to be very polarizing, you know, with a lot of folks saying that even though they support affordable housing, they have, you know, issues with this project, um, its location or parking or, you know, they, they've, they've named a couple of, of factors. Um, what do you think explains this divide that people recognize the need but don't, you know, um, have these other objections that seem to surmount it? Yeah, um, you know, I, I should preface by saying, I, you know, I haven't spoken to the, anyone in the opposition group there. I, you know, I only know this through sort of media and, and reports and things like that. Um, um, nor have I spoken to those, that particular set of developers. I think, you know, to, to take a little bit of a step back, right? The sort of like Yimby idea. And I think Yimby, yes, in my backyard, uh, I, assume, I assume all, everybody knows that. Um, that group is a, um, that social movement, I think is a really important and powerful one, right? Um, it's always been a movement with sort of uncomfortable boundaries, right? And when we think about what Yimby means in the context of, um, you know, the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian government and rights to land and who's deciding who gets to say the yes versus the no, um, I think it becomes very complicated and something we should we should interrogate um, uh, a lot here. That being said, my understanding of um, that form of NIMBYism uh, in the Kailua example is that it's not about that, right? It's about the very um, my reading, just from the quotes that people are, are the opposition is giving in, in the media, you know, it has this very, what I would consider standard idea of, yes, we like affordable, but we don't want it there. It's an eyesore. It'll block my view. It'll shade my um, solar panels. It doesn't fit with the character of the neighborhood and all those things. Um, and I think, you know, and this is, you know, when we're talking about proactive things that faith action members can do, and really pushing back on that. Right, any any change, no matter how good, is going to have opposition, right? Um, and those voices are going to be very, very loud, right? Um, and so it's very powerful, and I think California has learned this when you have voices in a community that understand that, yeah, any affordable housing development, you know, it, for some people is might not be aesthetically pleasing. It's an extra story over, you know, the Taco Bell next door, right? Um, but it's you know, worth it, right? And part of being a community that supports each other and part of being a community where we're providing access to quality schools um, and just allocation of housing resources means that what I consider superficial concerns around amount largely to economic protectionism um, and pushing back on those narratives, right? Taking the time to go, it seems weird to go to a community association to say, you know what, I support this, right? Because we sort of assume, well, that's the developer's job. They're gonna support it, right? And then anyone who opposes it's gonna come and they'll have an argument and uh, we'll resolve it. But I think getting people out there into these meetings to say, this is a good thing. This is something that Kailua needs. This is the type of deeply affordable, because most of it's under 60% AMI, as I'm understanding it. Uh, this is the type of deeply affordable housing that members of our community need to have and that we need to have on the island. Um, and so, you know, someone's just that, you know, we shouldn't ignore any of the sort of rational concerns around environmental protection and whatever, but we should, I think, empower ourselves to say, you know, we're going to, as a community, need these things. Everyone would want it somewhere else. And so we need to be the community that embraces it and says, like, bring it into my neighborhood. And, um, and so, you know, I'm hoping that around this Kailua development that we're seeing um, that sort of positive push, you know, the folks I know in Kailua at least are uh, very supportive of affordable housing and more, you know, would be enthusiastic to have um, it in their neighborhoods, right? Uh, all the data suggests that um, most of the concerns around housing values and crime or in any of the sort of things you hear as um, scare tactics against affordable housing, they're either very, very, very small or they're non-existent in terms of like crime, things like that, they're non-existent. Um, and so, you know, being proactive um, in that regard is something that's important. So. Well, that, that's a great um, insight and I think great segue into us talking more about, you know, how can we move forward given that we all recognize uh, uh, that this is a huge issue in Hawaii. I mean, that's, I, I think it's safe to say that's not even a question anymore, so I won't bother you 
<laughs> with asking if it is. Um, you know, advocates are interested in creating a more just housing system that you know ensures all residents have access to adequate housing that's affordable. And um, from your perspective, um, what what types of components should this more just housing policy have? What what are the necessary components? Yeah. Um, so many, right, I think is, is always my take home, right? I think the fact, idea that one policy would solve it is, um, it may, you know, is not the right way to think about this, right? What we need is a number of policies targeting different portions of the problem, moving incrementally towards a more um, equitable housing system, right? Um, so some of that, right, to get back to the sort of like income crisis, rent crisis, um, distinction, some of that is about um, pushing for more subsidies and the prioritization of those subsidies towards housing, right? Um, and as I said before, you know, that could mean more vouchers, that could mean more funds to build explicitly affordable housing, all of those types of things, right? Um, you know, to me, there's um, a need for all, even within that, there's still a need for both, right? Vouchers are quick, they can be scaled up fairly quickly, assuming you can find landlords who are willing to take them. Um, you know, longer term issues around developing new explicitly affordable housing take longer, but you know, then you have sort of permanent durable um, stock and different parts of the, the demographics of folks who need affordable housing um, are gonna need different things, right? I mean, the evidence definitely suggests that vouchers work for some families and work really well for some families um, insofar as they provide choice. Um, but some families, when presented with a voucher, can't utilize the voucher, right? And so they end up with no subsidy, um, or they end up with um, a housing situation that is worse than what they were, were in before, um, albeit cheaper. So um, that's important. You know, I think other folks um, in the seminar have done a better, a good job of like talking through what um, can be done in terms of reversing market failure. And to me, it's about taking. Um, the limits to housing development here in Hawaii and having an honest discussion about which one of those are important, right? Um, in terms of preserving our land, the environment, um, space for uh, people who need it, not disrupting cultural sites. You know, obviously there are enormous parts of the regulatory apparatus here that are important um, and I would never authorize changing. But then there are others that are, um, you know, exist primarily for nurture, from inertia or to promote particular special interests that I don't think benefit the community um, broadly, right? Um, and for those having an honest discussion about them, um, you know, why, for example, for this Kailua development, is there, you know, you know, you're, wh why do you need an exemption, right? You're building affordable housing, it's a little more dense, right? You're building it on top of already developed, you know, single family housing, so there's no worry there, right? As long as you can show that you can flush the toilets and you're not having an enormous environmental impact, you know, why does there need to be this sort of complex process of rezoning? I think what we're seeing is the more processes you put into um, a timeline, the more opportunities you have for people who, um, just to say it bluntly, are, are self-interested to disrupt that timeline, right? Even if that particular juncture is created for what seems like sensible reasons, the more of those you have, the more opportunities you have to block, you know, projects that have, you know, an overall positive um, in effect on, on communities. And so um, trying to minimize those. Um, and then the third piece of it, um, so that's, you know, that involves a big coalition, right? With Faith Action and other groups saying, we need to push back on this. Here are the ones that we understand are incredibly important to preserve, but here's where we think there's some flexibility. Um, and then there's also a um, how you implement those same regulations, right? And I think you know we see about this from the expanding timelines of planning and permitting here, right? Having a longer timeline does not prevent something from being built; it just makes it more expensive to build, right? So things that you're going to approve, right? That the sort of democratic process is going to eventually approve should be approved quickly, right? Um, so that the costs of the delay aren't passed on to the end users of the housing, right? Um, and so there, you know, that comes down to, um, you know, I think it's easy, from, this is my opinion, it's, I think it's easy to say, oh, that particular agency should be working faster, and, you know, why aren't they working faster, and let's, you know, make a law that they have to work faster. 
that's all well and good. I think to me, it's like agencies work at the pace of their resources, right? So some of this is investing in these agencies with the resources they need to do the job of um, approving permits or whatever else um, in an expedited way, right? I mean, I don't think any of us work at full capacity at our jobs 24 seven, right? And we all have coworkers who perhaps are not uh, pulling their weight. You know, that's an agency reality. You can, should minimize that and good managers do minimize that. But you also need to understand that like the denominator is always resources. So I'm always, you know, I'm always more interested in proactive solutions to things like that, that involve expanding resources um, to agencies that are, you know, in the way as it were, um, to affordable housing development rather than, you know, the sort of the attempting to do it by fiat. Like it should be faster, I think you know that. Um, you know, so that's, those are my sort of like bucket take homes here. Um, you know, there's a million specific policies that, um, you know, I try to look at it at a very case by case basis, but, um, you know, more explicitly subsidized housing and then, you know, addressing the sort of minimizing the market failures associated with barriers to development of affordable housing are my two sort of like um, proactive um, avenues. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, and, and obviously there's so much more we could delve into. <laughs> you, you could probably teach a class on it. No. Um, <laughs> I am, if anyone wants to get a master's in urban planning, housing policy next semester. <laughs> um, now, there are also some um, existing programs, supply side programs even, that Hawaii has, like the Rental Housing Revolving Fund. And um, one of the audience questions was if you had any insight as to the accessibility of this fund, since they have not accepted any applications to it since last year. Yeah, um, the exp I've also noticed that um, that gap, I haven't looked into it. Um, so I'm, I don't wanna speculate as to why that is. That particular fund fills an incredibly important role, right? So whenever you're developing housing, right? You have the amount that you could subsidize if you know, the amount that you could afford um, just from the rents that you're taking in, right? Um, and here that's not, remotely enough, right? And so you always have these really long, large capital stacks where you're layering that with the low income housing tax credit, local tax credits, philanthropic support. And so things like the rental housing revolving fund um, are really essential ways to make projects, affordable housing projects penciled and wooden. Um, and so whatever the delay is with that, and I, I, that's not, I don't know that yet, um, should be reversed. I also um, to sort of build off that, I think we're in a, one of the silver linings to the forthcoming, you know, two year economic downturn is that um, everyone expects, and this hasn't manifested yet, but everyone expects the market to soften a bit, whether that's population decline, sort of the continued reduction in the amount of vacation rentals, either by policy or just because tourists uh, drops. Um, so during that period, there's an enormous opportunity, right, that we have um, as a state to essentially buy low, right? Um, you know, we shouldn't celebrate that because we're buying low on the backs of an economic recession. But given the opportunities of this moment, there's this real worry in my mind that um, the sort of prevailing wisdom will be we're in a position, the state's in a position of not having enough funds which is true, therefore everything about promoting affordable housing, development, spending money on affordable housing is sort of put into this bucket of we'll deal with that when we recover after we recover, right? And that's dangerous not only because people need that affordable housing, but it's dangerous because that means we're gonna be buying land, we're gonna be doing development we're gonna, when it's yet again so expensive to do so, right? If there are opportunities to bring properties either through master leases or through purchasing or through redevelopment and preservation into the affordable housing, those properties are gonna be the cheapest they'll ever be um, you know, in 2001, 2002, right? And so we need to make sure that things like the rental housing revolving fund are like up and ready and churning during that period, right? We can't like have this like, we'll deal with that after the crisis issue because it'll be much more expensive to deal with it then, right? Not to mention the obvious um, human costs. So, you know, I think, again, when you talk about what proactively faith action folks can do, pushing on 
not having an austerity mindset when it comes to housing, really pushing on an opportunity mindset of, you know, you know, and maybe the market won't go down, in which case we have a different whole another set of problems. But if it does go, if it does drop, and drop here means increases less rapidly, right? Um, then you know we got to time that right. Um, you know we got to time it when um, folks are you know. We, I'll just leave it at that. But we need to we need to time that, and so making sure that these tools we have stay functioning throughout the crisis is really important. Yeah, um, and that's it's another great call to action. So thanks for that. Um, on a related, well, somewhat related front, um, you know, what are your thoughts on um, zoning and land use regulation and how those can affect the development of affordable housing? And you know, if you think there are any changes that need to be made. They make a huge they make a huge difference. I think the data supports that almost unanimously, right? Um, and uh, there's a great new book out called Neighborhood Defenders by uh, Catherine Einstein and some other folks. Uh, I don't know if she's in relation to physicists, but um, and she looks at um, there's a really neat design where she's looking at um, properties that sort of randomly came on the market in different small jurisdictions in Massachusetts and looking at how the land use regulatory apparatus and those different places affects you know what gets built how fast it gets built how affordable it is etc and yeah um yet again more evidence to suggest that these things matter you know as i said you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater here right you know we need to be protecting things right and regulation does that so uh, i think the sort of like let people build wherever they want whenever they want is not um is not the answer that being said things like single family zoning areas where you're not allowing you know even modestly more dense um, housing. Um, again, based on these same logics we're seeing in the newspapers uh, on the Kailua project of, you know, this is a single family neighborhood, historical character, all those things. To me, those are major impediments. They don't seem to serve anything, um, any particular, you know, valid use other than protecting, uh, or not even really protecting, but allowing people to feel that they're protected, right? Um, you know, they're, they're perfectly well protected if we allow duplexes in some areas. So. Um, you know, I think that's a, a huge um, a component here, you know, and um, yeah, I think it gets muddled a lot here politically. And I think, you know, we, especially because of um, land use here and, and um, Hawaiian homelands and other aspects of, you know, how we understand land use in this state, um, it can get muddled real quick. But we need, I would encourage people to say like, okay, this is why it's so important to always be repeating. This is not about ending those things. It's about preserving, it's about stopping essentially limited interest groups um, who want to believe that they are preserving their home values by maintaining exclusionary zoning, um, preventing them from doing so, right? This is not about, you know, this is not about land use commission, you know, that's a whole other thing. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about um, what we're doing in terms of already developed land, what is allowed to be built, for whom um, and when, um, and the ability for self-interested folks to block that is um, way too high uh, here and everywhere. Basically. Yeah, um, we have about ten minutes left. So if anyone has any other questions, please let us know. But um, one thing that I wanted to ask is, um, you know, there are so many, like you said, so many things you could do on so many different fronts, but if you were in charge for a day, is there one thing you would do immediately to, that you feel would have the most outsized difference in, in shape, changing the affordable housing crisis here? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I mean, in, so, in some ways, you uh, just to, to perhaps to buy some time, right? The, uh, you know, I don't think king for a day governancing is, is a good idea, right? People have expertise that um, I don't around these issues. And so I wouldn't want to uh, impose, you know, of course, what I know um, without, without that. Um, Maybe advisor for a day. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I think allocating resources to explicit developing explicitly affordable housing, right. May, um, is, an important thing. I know resources come out of pocket A, they, they go into pocket B, you know, it's not a not a, uh, a magical scenario, but because housing is so foundational and um, I think that's important. Um, I do think addressing the um, the exclusionary zoning aspects that we have here um, is important. Um, 
you know, again, land use is as important as any, as, is as complicated as there are numbers of parcels of land, right? But um, the sort of broad goal of eliminating uh, barriers to densification um, in um, already developed land in, um, in the state is to me a very important one. Um, and then I think, you know, around the housing voucher program, I think making that program work better, that means we're making it um, bigger, means reforming aspects of that program. And, you know, again, there's regulatory barriers to this at the federal level. So um, I'd have to be king of the country too to make this possible, but, you know, making changes to how that program operates to make it more attractive to landlords so that we can then pass source of income protection legislation, which would require landlords to accept tenants who otherwise pass their screening criteria, right? Um, to accept vouchers um, and not be worried that there's, you know, concerns about like, what are, what are the consequences of that for landlords, right? The voucher program can be implemented in my mind in a way that is largely, um, a lar should largely be neutral to landlords, assuming they're maintaining their properties at sort of legal levels. Um, and therefore we should, we should approach that, so. Um, so speaking of, um, you know, all of these efforts to, from the government, I guess you're saying from the government to encourage um, the development. Um, let's say today, if there are companies interested in developing affordable housing pro uh, projects, um, one of the co uh, participant uh, viewers writes that funding and financing these projects is one of the setbacks or deterrents. Um, are you aware if there's a list or centralized resource of information that identifies, um, you know, different potential funding for programs or grants, things like that? Um, I don't think that there is a list. I think it would be a useful thing to create. I mean, HHFDC um, is sort of the uh, air traffic controller of explicitly affordable housing developer here in the state, and the folks there have a lot of expertise uh, because some form of funding through HHFDC, whether that's tax credit or other state and local, um, uh, you know, the revolving fund, for example, um, flows to them. They will have a good sense of what other sources of finance are. Um, you know, I think getting through the public programs is fairly straightforward and knowing what those all are. Um, I think getting to, um, you know, what are the philanthropic options and what are the private capital options, right? If there's a way to make, um, affordable housing development pencil for, you know, profit motivated investors, you know, who are obviously going to take a reduction in their profit for doing affordable housing potentially, but um, might still be interested in doing that, bringing those monies to the table. That's where it gets a little more, more complicated. So, um, but yeah, developing that resource, um, I think is a really important one um, and helping people understand what those options are. Um, and because they, they, they largely define what's possible, right? What the, you know, the rules related to the loan income housing tax credit and the various re local revolving funds define pretty strongly where affordable housing is going to be built, who it's going to be built for, um, and what it looks like. And that's not a criticism of it, right? You need to target your, your programs, but, um, but what those programs are drive what gets built and where. So um, it's important, I think, for um, to sort of democratize that information um, and get people who want to push for more affordable housing, sort of to have good um, baseline expertise and what can what resources can be brought to bear um, for it. So yeah, I think that's, you know, I can add that to my to my list of um, sort of public work that I want to engage in. So. Okay, great. Um, a couple of last maybe uh, rapid fire questions before we, <laughs> we close. Um, as a UH professor, are you able to take a position on an affordable housing project by submitting testimony um, to the city council or, or I guess the legislature? Um, I'm allowed to do, I think, I mean, I can always, the, the legal answer is yes, right? My particular answer um, is that I, you know, I try to be fairly, cautious about, um, you know, put, uh, yeah, so, yes, I mean, the, the, the short answer is yes. Um, my, the long answer is, you know, I like to, when I publicly support something, to be very, very thoughtful about it, not just consider sort of like, does this seem like a good idea, the way I would like have a conversation with a friend, but, um, but like, you know, have I seen the pro forma? Does it seem to be penciling out? Does it need and all of those things? So um, I try to, I have a high bound bar for like 
doing that because I don't want to be in the position of just sort of haphazardly supporting things. But um, absolutely, if there's a good project um, and, you know, I don't want to wade into like prioritizing one developer over another or any of those types of things. But if there's a good project that, um, you know, is in need of support um, and there's good information about what it is, um, yeah, I, I, have, I have no barriers to, to supporting it. Um, okay, that's good to know. Um, now this, this uh, question, um, there, there's a lot that you could go into, but if you have a short thought about how to um, encourage affordable housing along the rail line, um, I mean, that, that is a very, very big question. I mean, I think um, it's very important to be proactive about it, right? Like once, once the rail's up and running, um, unless the land's been acquired and the housing's been acquired, um, it's again, this sort of opportunity cost idea of you need to get in early, right? Because when you build a rail line, um, you increase land values, you increase desirability, increase competition for private development in those areas. And so the um, getting in early. It's my understanding that the TOD folks are, are doing that and are doing a good, uh, as good a job as possible at like trying to get, be proactive about preserving affordable housing um, in those areas. Um, you know, all sorts of questions about, you know, given essentially, you know, because we're this large state subsidy in terms of building the rail line, which in and of itself is sort of a subsidy for land developers, the degree to which, you know, affordable housing requirements versus other forms of taxation, which then require build, just building the affordable housing the city, county, or state, you know, all of those types of questions get into minutiae. I definitely don't have time for right now. Um, but, you know, I love, it's an important and very important thing to be thinking about. Thanks. Um, I think maybe just one last question. And again, I'm sorry to compress your answers into no. <laughs> to such big questions. But, um, you know, there's a couple questions about funding and financing and sort of um, the uh, costs and benefits, so to speak, of private financing or, you know, just public projects, you know, I guess the P3 model versus, um, you know, just a public housing project. Um, yeah, um, it's hard to comment on that. I mean, I feel like a lot of folks have strong sort of ideological positions about whether they think there should be private money in development and all of those things, you know, I tend to, um, you know, my, I, I tend to, like, from a policy perspective, try to look at like that particular project and is it necessary to have XYZ funding in it to, um, to make it happen at all, right? And sort of all, you always have to think about what the counterfactual is, right? If the counterfactual is um, something um, better, at, um, then that's a debate. If the counterfactual is nothing, then that's the comparison you should be making. So um, in general, I think, you know, public-private partnerships to build affordable housing, mixed use, you know, again, non-ideologically as sort of a concession to the world we live in, um, I think is, you know, are quite powerful opportunities to expand the affordable housing stock. Um, you know, in general, if it's only um, public money, then I think you can have a, some more control, you can, you know, increase the density of affordability, you can increase the sort of like levels at which it's affordable, but of course, you know, that money's coming from, you know, public resources. So, um, so, yeah. Basically, it depends. I think there's meaningful differences in terms of the tenant experience and the different development things. Um, again, not necessarily ones that map neatly onto do this, don't do this, but are something to be aware of as well. So yeah, I, I, unfortunately, I don't think that's a question I can answer in, in two minutes very uh, to anyone's satisfaction. <laughs> well, there's so much more we could delve into, but I we should respect people's time here for this hour. Um, so I just want to say thanks again um, to our guest, Philip Garboden, for being with us today. And I'll mention you can see all of his work that we mentioned um, at philipgarboden.com. Uh, follow him on Twitter, uh, Philip Garboden, right? Um, I think so, yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure he can answer more questions. There, there's some more that I'll pass off to you offline as well. Absolutely. I mean, send, send me an email. Um, you know, I don't always get to emails, you know, immediately, but I try to answer when folks, uh, um, folks have questions. And so please, please reach out. Uh, well, thanks again. This has been a very productive discussion. And, and before you all leave, I'm just going to put up a quick anonymous survey to see, you know, sort of your thoughts from today. Just one question. Uh, and aside from that, we'll see you at the next edition of Our Homes Ending the Housing Crisis. Thanks again. Thank you all.